Hi everybody and welcome back to my channel. It's Russell with Ink and Paper Blog. How are you doing this Sunday? I hope you guys are having a fantastic weekend. As always, I hope it's full of reading. I hope that the weather has been whatever you so wish it to be. It is beautiful here in Northern California. Um, and I hope that you got reading, family time, relaxation, and whatever you needed this weekend to be for you. I hope you got it. Um, a couple of housekeeping things real quick. One, a big shout out and thank you to my friend Richard Reeds who sent me this amazing t-shirt for my birthday. He's a few weeks early, but that's okay. I like my presents to come in in stages. Um, he sent me two amazing t-shirts, and Richard has his own booktube channel. He's been on a bit of hiatus because he is studying, I believe, for his CPA exam. So chop chop, Richard, time to get that over with so we can get you back on booktube. But I want to say big thank you. I love this shirt. It sort of looks like a husky version of Baxter reading a book, so love it. Um, and then second, I want to just say a big thank you to everyone that commented on my last video about my reading philosophy. You guys are fantastic. Thank you for all the love. Thank you for all the phenomenal comments and the support. I really, really appreciate it. I'm going to sit down um, tonight probably and start responding um, in force to everyone's comments. I've been hitting them here and there as they come in on my phone, but I need to sit down and do it because I just want to say thank you. You guys are amazing. So today's video is actually kind of exciting. I am creating my own tag. Now I have never created a tag. I have no idea if this will work and it may just be a one-off video and we'll never see another one. But I really liked the idea of this and I wanted to see some answers from other people. So let's tell me tell you how this all started. As readers, you know, we're asked probably the two most obvious questions which is, what is your favorite book of all time? And what is the best book you've read recently? We are, that is sort of when you are talking to a person who is a non-reader, that's where they usually go to. But I was having a conversation with a friend of mine regarding literature, and we were talking really about the books and the authors that we really felt built the foundation for us as readers and literature that we currently love, and where we see literature going. What is our literary canon? And we started really talking about the authors that have formed us, and we feel form the literature that is important to us. Now, um, so that's sort of what spawned the idea for this. So I have a few rules. They're very, very loose rules. The first is all authors that are going to be mentioned in the tag should publish after 1900. That leaves pretty much everyone before that is the generally consensus canon out of the picture. I want to talk about people that are not talked about maybe as much as others. Some people will be talked about. Some people are literary important and they are talked about and deservedly so. I'm going to talk about a few of them here. Um, but I'm trying to stay into sort of the modern era of literature. Two, I've created three categories. The first category is what I'm calling the literary concrete. Who is the base of the literary canon from my point of view or your point of view if you do this tag? These people should no longer be with us, but their literature, in your opinion, should stand the test of time. You think these are books and authors that people really should be reading for the rest of eternity. Um, the second is going to be Literary Legacy. These are authors that are still currently with us, however, they are firmly established. We feel like what they have done in their literary career means that they're going to be around for the ages to come. And thirdly, it's going to be what I'm calling the literary future. These are the authors that are writing currently, that are maybe newer to the scene, who are publishing books and have a voice that you feel is really, really going to be the future, the future of literature. Now, I want you to interpret this any way you want. I want you, if you are a complete YA reader and you read YA in middle grade, do that from this perspective. If you are a sci-fi fantasy reader, please do that from that perspective. I think it applies to all of it. If you are a nonfiction reader, I think you can do this in that way as well. There are sort of canons that can exist for every type of reader and really things that we find really important. So the only last caveat in this tag is we are not really here to talk about all the individual books that these authors have written. Um, so we're going to really just talk about how they are important to us as readers and why we think they're important to the world of literature. So should keep it fairly short when we're talking to them. Now I have 
stacks of books over here to share with you guys because I'm going to hold up the authors, sort of what I have in my stacks uh, here with me in my house. Um, so I apologize, it's going to be a little moving back and forth. Um, but what am I going to start with and who am I going to start with? So one second. The first author I'm going to start with is William Faulkner. This is my Faulkner collection. Let me turn it there. I first read William Faulkner as a freshman in college in an introduction to American literature class where I read The Sound and the Fury. I read The Sound and the Fury, the first section, and had no idea what was going on. But I realized that I was reading someone who really changed my mind about literature. And I have read so much Faulkner that I see him in so much of what I read nowadays. He created a world, his own little tiny town in Mississippi. He talked about things that I think are relevant still today. And I still think that what he did on the page stands the test of time in regards to great, phenomenal American literature. To me, he is one of the people that influences the writers that I am inspired by writing today. So, William Faulkner, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to call out for you sort of my favorite book by each author, and my favorite William Faulkner is definitely um, The Light in August, which is right there, Light in August. I was like, I don't have a copy of that? No, I do. So this is my William Faulkner collection right there, and I really, really feel highly attached to him because he changed my literary sort of um, education when I read him. The next author I'm going to tell you about is going to be no surprise because I've already raved about her a hundred thousand times, and that is the amazing Zora Neale Hurston. I read some um, article about Their Eyes Were Watching God being the most read novel by an African American writer, and I'm not sure if it's from the point of view of, um, I can't remember all of the details. but. I was so happy to see it because I think their eyes are watching God. You don't need anything else, in my opinion, when it comes to Zora Neale Hurston. I think this book in and of itself is freaking brilliant. And the thing, the reason is she collect, she takes you to a place, a time. Her dialect is so phenomenal. Her imagery, I still think the first few pages of this book are two of the most amazing pages ever written in literary history. Um, I think that she is an author that has written and said so much about so many things. Um, and I could read Their Eyes Were Watching God as one of those books over and over and over again. So I read it first in 11th grade, and then I read it twice more in college, and I have read it twice as an adult, and it has never lost its power to me. So Zora Neale Hurston is the second author in my literary cement category. The next author, again, also will not um, be any surprise to you guys, and that is the phenomenal John Williams. John Williams wrote four novels. Um, he started his career with Nothing But The Night, but really Stoner to me is the apex, though I love all of his books for different reasons, and you don't really get a good view of my Stoner copy because it's this weird embossed. Um, Stoner is tied, probably, for my favorite book of all time. What I love about John Williams is his language, his variety. None of his books are in all the same in any way, shape, or form. Um, and he tells a story, and he usually tells a story about people. And there may not be a whole lot going on, but you are invested in the lives of his characters and the language that he is sharing with you. Um, I have raved a number of times about John Williams, so I will not spend much time on him. But if you haven't read him, please do. Um, and if you've only read Stoner, please read Butcher's Crossing, please read Augustus. They're both amazing novels in their own right, and so different, and so brilliant. Okay, how am I? I'm running out of room because I have so much. Uh, the next uh, author that I'm going to talk to you guys about, and this is my sort of, the story behind this stack of books, is the amazing Barbara Pym. Ooh, let's turn that. I actually find that found this whole entire stack of Barbara Pym paperback novels for 99 cents each at my used bookstore, and I could not have been happier. I call Barbara Pym the author that I go to when I need to just feel like I'm home in literature. She has a wit, she has a sense of community, she has a sense of style, all her own. But she also has just a way of making me feel good about what I'm reading. I I mean, Excellent Women and Quartet in Autumn are probably her two most famous novels. 
I really, really love them. I think they're fantastic. I would highly recommend some tame gazelles. And I also really like um, an, an, an unsuitable attachment. I can always, can't remember how the beginning of that works. Um, but I think Barbara Pym to me is my go-to. If I am in an utter funk and I cannot figure out what I want to read next, Barbara Pym is where I go. She is that to me. She is that base. She is where my literary heart starts, if that is. So, there you go. Barbara Pym. Love her, love her, love her. Okay. Next in the list is a Hungarian author, and that is the fantastic Margaret Zabo. Now, these are three of her novels translated into English. I have read The Door and um, Catalin Street. I have not read Isis Ballad. That is on my agenda for this year. Um, what I will say is that I had never heard of Magda Zabdo until a few years ago when my book club read The Door, and then I became obsessed, really, with a woman who had such amazing power with language. Um, and she, again, she's one of those people, her books don't have a whole lot of plot, which you know is a thing for me. Um, but the way she sets up characters and emotions and all of that really just blew my mind. When I think Magda Zabo and I think about who she sort of inspires to me, she inspires those writers who take a moment or a place and just use words to develop it 100% in your mind's eye that you feel like you're in a situation or with a person or in a world, and it's a real world, all by yourself. Um, I absolutely love Magda Zabo, and yeah, I think she's phenomenal. Highly recommend her. And then, last but not least in the literary cement category is the amazing Octavia Butler. Um, I would argue that Kindred is a book that everybody should read at least twice, because I think it's more sophisticated than a one-time read. Um, but I also think Parable of the Sower is probably the greatest dystopian novel that I have ever read in my entire life. And when you read that book, you see where all of the dystopian novels <laughs> henceforth have come. Um, it's really funny. I've, re I've read the book a couple times, and I see The Walking Dead. I see Station Eleven. I see um, Severance. I see how Octavia Butler has inspired people and really just is a voice in and of herself. Um, she has such a literary talent, um, and I just think she's phenomenal. And when I think science fiction, my brain sort of falls to her as one of the people that really started it in my world. I just think she's amazing. So that are, those are, that are, those are sort of the five or six authors that are in my literary cement category. And I'm going to now, going to now share with you those who are in my literary legacy category. And one of them has a humongous stack and is also going to be no surprise here. This is my collection of books by, oh, turn it, turn it, turn it turn it and go. Okay, this is my Toni Morrison collection. Toni Morrison, I read Song of Solomon as a junior in college. I had read Beloved a number of times. I like Beloved, don't get me wrong, I think it is very, very good. But when I read Song of Solomon, I knew then and there that I was in the hands of an absolute genius. I have read now all but one of Toni Morrison's books, and I truly, truly believe that she may be the greatest American writer of all time. All of her books deal with people and race and love and loss and coming into your own in such ways and friendship and she can just tear your, she literally can use five words to tear your heart out or to lift you up to such high, high levels. Um, I, I always tell people, if you haven't read Song of Solomon, stop what you're doing and read Song of Solomon right now. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, I also highly always recommend The Bluest Eye. Beloved is also very good. Um, her later works are very different. They're softer to me, but they are also brilliant in all of their ways. I loved God Help um, the Child. Um, yeah, so I love, love, love Toni Morrison. And I think that of all the living writers right now, to me, she is where I go when I want to say who is the greatest writer, in my opinion. So, I have to put this book pile down, though. It's really heavy. Oh, my goodness. The next author that I'm going to go to is one that really changed for me the way I thought about literature. 
and that is the amazing Cormac McCarthy. Cormac McCarthy is not everyone's cup of tea. I absolutely know that. However, he does for me what very few authors do is he makes writing visceral. He makes it bloody and angry and real in so many ways. I really remember when I read, for the first book I read by Cormac McCarthy was All the Pretty Horses, and I thought, this man doesn't use quotation marks. What in the world? This is never going to work for me. Well, who was I? I was no one. But every time I read any author, especially any male author now, I see where Cormac McCarthy has made his mark in American letters. Um, I think that he creates the um, sort of the Midwest, the Texas, the um, South, all of that, he creates it in such a way that people will always be striving to be as good as he is. I also think he has a way of taking stuff that is brutal and sometimes really graphic, but making it poetically beautiful with language and also making it important. He doesn't ever throw in anything that doesn't need to be there. Like, it's there for a reason. Um, if you haven't read Blood Meridian, I mean, I know All the Pretty Horses, I know The Road, which I had a copy of The Road, I gave it to someone and they lost it, and then they gave me a movie tie-in copy. So I have to get another copy of The Road. I do think The Road is brilliant as well. But Blood Meridian, to me, is probably one of the top ten American novels of all time, and it is definitely in my top ten American novels of all time. And I think Cormac McCarthy is freaking brilliant. Okay, I want to say I think this is the last person in this category. And again, another huge pile because I am such a fan. And that is David Mitchell. Oh, there we go. Let's go back this way. Uh, David Mitchell, when I read Cloud Atlas, I was blown away. It was so different and so inventive to me that I thought this man is doing something that I've never seen before. And now I've read a number of his books and I know that it is sort of a play of his to have these interconnected stories, sometimes through time, some through location, and really how he brings that all together is always freaking amazing. But I will say Cloud Atlas is in my top favorite books of all time, but The A Thousand Autumns of Jacob de Zote is one of my favorite books as well, and it is a much more straightforward tale of the Dutch um, trading with Japan um, that has just so much beautiful language and word, and oh, it's so good, you guys. Um, David Mitchell, to me, is one of those writers that when he has a book come out, I automatically buy it. I saw him in person once. I thought he was just lovely and genuine, and I really, really enjoy everything he writes. Um, to me, he is the one who introduced this idea of this uh, one, these stories throughout time that interconnect in such a way that I was on the edge of my seat. I see a lot of um, sort of Margaret Atwood in him sometimes too. She almost made this list very close to being in this pile. Um, but um, you can't you can't talk about everybody. You can't talk about everybody. But David Mitchell, he always transports me. Wherever he wants to take me, I go and I'm 100% bought in. So David Mitchell is the last in my literary legacy categories. I am a firm believer that we will be reading Cloud Atlas and A Thousand Autumns of Jacob, Jacob de Zotes for years and years to come. Okay, so who is next? Next comes those authors that I think are the literary future. The authors that I think that are producing work now that we will be reading forever. This is actually, this was hard. This was really, really hard. But we're going to start with a few people, and I don't have to say much about any of them because you guys will probably all agree. But I'm going to start with the phenomenal um, Chimanda Ngozi Adichie. All of her books are worth reading. Her nonfiction is worth reading. Her TED Talk is worth watching. She creates um, such people and in such instances with such language that is freaking gorgeous. Um, I have read everything everything she has written now. Oops, and that one's about to go over. And I can't think of a, there are very few authors that I need very little to be inspired. Um, I am having a hard time with my camera. Um, but I ref definitely feel like she is one of the authors that is m just blowing it out of the water when it comes to changing the dynamic of literature. Um, and I absolutely love everything she's written. Ch uh, Chimanda Ngozi Adichie. There you go. Okay, next on this list, where should I go next? 
is an American author who probably could have gone in the other direction, in the middle section, but that is the phenomenal Colson Whitehead. Now, Colson Whitehead wrote The Underground Railroad, which is what we most people probably know him for, but he has been producing amazing literature ever, ever, ever since he started. If you guys haven't read Zone 1, let me make sure that that is uh, right, because you know how it is. Zone 1. Um, uh, I, it is his take on the zombie tale. What Colson Whitehead is doing that makes him stand out is he is tackling the idea of race from many different perspectives and or racism in such a way that you sometimes don't know where he is going with it or what the allegory is, but once you get it, you realize he's brilliant. He has a new book coming out, The Nickel Boys. It's coming out in a few months. Um, and I think it will be just as huge as the Underground Railroad. And I think he's freaking brilliant. I think that he has a, he is saying what needs to be said in a way that is going to be heard for years and decades and generations to come. Colson Whitehead, highly recommend him. Okie dokie. Where am I going to go next? Um, let's go to a couple of authors and I just dropped two books. Um, the phenomenal Miriam Toves. She is a Canadian author. I'm just going to say, because I've talked about her a lot on my channel, if you haven't read Women Talking that came out this year or All My Puny Sorrows from a few years ago, please stop what you're doing. Buy these books. Get them from your library. Um, she has a way of talking about religion and faith that is new and fresh. She is a, she was Mennonite. She was raised Mennonite. I don't believe she's any longer a practicing Mennonite. I hope to get to see her in a couple of weeks here in California, and I'm so excited. Um, and she talks about how faith changes and or is looked at from different perspectives um, and how you have to make decisions based upon your faith, faith at certain times in your life. She will break your heart. She's got sort of a straightforward style to her, but in such a way that you are always on the edge of your seat with the story and she makes you care about people with just the turn of one phrase you can have yourself laughing with someone or breaking your heart um i think all the puny sorrows and women talking are standout novels for all time and i think people should read them if they want to look at how to tackle faith in a different and unique perspective I love her, and I think we will be reading her for years and ages to come. Okay. I have to bend down and get these two books that here. I'm not sure, but I definitely feel like Sally Rooney is going to be an author that we are reading for ages to come. She is a new, young voice. She is an Irish author. Conversation with friends and normal people. I know people are probably tired of hearing about normal people because it has been the talk of the town for a while. It skyrocketed probably to my one or two favorite books of all time. She has, she is doing something new and different with language. She's sort of, I know her books are sort of quasi explained as a millennial type um, narrative, but I think it's because she has taken literature and she has taken language and made it so sparse and on the nose that she doesn't need to do much to get across what she wants you to understand. I think she's freaking brilliant. Again, I don't need much plot. None of her books have much plot in them, but they're all about the people, they're all about the language, and they're all about the relationships. And to me, she's the future of writing. She's one of the futures of what literature is going to become. There you go. Okay, I have two more authors to tell you about. This video turned out longer than I thought. Um, this is the phenomenal Japanese author, Yogo, um, Yoko Agona, uh, Yoko Agawa. I'm sorry, having a hard time with language today. I've been talking a while. Um, if you have not read Yoko Agawa, stop what you're doing because the house, uh, the housekeeper and the, the, and the professor and also Hotel Iris are brilliant. She has Revenge, which is her short story collection, which is dark and gritty. And she has a new book coming out. I haven't really highlighted on my channel yet because it just came into me, but The Memory Police, which I am so excited to read. Um, she is phenomenal. She writes so stylistically different. Each of her books has a different tone, a different perspective, but it is so beautiful. And she, again, you can tell what's important to me is people, relationships, and talking in a language that is sort of out of the norm and 
and sort of brings and elevates language to another level. Yoka Agawa does that. I absolutely think that when I read one of her books, I am lost. And usually she's taking me on a journey that I cannot even fathom where it's going to go in a unique and beautiful, absolutely phenomenal way. I am a huge fan of her work. So, Yoka Agawa, she is a Japanese author, and I think she is the one of the futures of literature in the world. And last but not least is an author that I have already told you, I think, is really the successor to the world of Toni Morrison and the future, one of the futures of American literature, and that is the phenomenal Jesmyn Ward. I'm not going to say much more than to say that Jesmyn Ward talks about real people. She talks about the people she knows. She focuses her novels in Mississippi, and in doing so, she has a way of creating language that is stark and real and beautiful. She has a slight sense of um, sort of magical realism to her books, but they, it always comes back to a real nugget of truth. And if you really step back and look at her book, she's talking about the world we live in, a hundred percent. And I think she is one of the greatest living writers currently producing books in America. Actually, I think all of these writers are amazing, so I don't know why I say that. But to me, Jasmine Ward is one of those authors that I hear she has something new coming out. I stop what I'm doing. I pick that date. I know I'm going to go get that book, and that's going to be what I read on the day it comes out, because she is that amazing. So that is my take on this tag. I hope that it takes off and I really would love to see some of my friends do this tag. You don't have to do as many authors in each section. It could be one or two. It could be three or four. Or you could be like me and have stacks of books all around you. I'd like to tag my friend Kendra Winchester, my, fr uh, my friend Jacqueline at Six Minutes to Me. Um, I really would love to know what you would put in this. I'd tag my friend Britta Bowler because I would love to know what she picks from her past reading. I bet she would introduce me to a lot of European authors that I am not familiar with. Matthew Sharapa, if you're up for doing a tag, my friend, I'd be fascinated to know what you would put in these categories. I know that, Simon, you don't do many tags, but again, I think Simon, Mercedes, Jen Campbell, I'd be fascinated to know what would wind up in these categories for you. If you are a return subscriber, as always, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to me today. This is a long video. If you are new to my channel, I hope that all of these authors are on your TBR or you love them as much as I do. And until next time, I wish you happy reading, and I'll talk to you later. Bye!